Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, you're listening to The Friendly Show. Uh, I am Adrian and uh, Yaro. Um, Yaro, how's it going? We haven't spoken in a while. Um, what yeah, what have you been up to? Yeah, it's been uh, quite a while. Hi, Adrian. Nice to hear you. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah, this uh, podcast is available not only in audio but in video, so feel free to check it out on YouTube. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what's been going on? Basically, for the last month, I've been building superrails.com. So, uh, you know, I've been running this uh, uh, YouTube channel for like two and a half or nearly three years. And uh, uh, finally, it'll be all available separately on superrails where you can uh, ask questions directly for each video. And uh, it'll be just a hopefully better experience uh, for browsing all this uh, content, like 200 videos that I have recorded so far than, uh, than what we've got on uh, YouTube. Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, I really wanted to talk to you now because, hey, you visited Bright and Ruby and I've been uh, looking uh, at your posts uh, on Twitter and I had such a like fear of missing out, like, hey, I should also be there, why didn't I go, why didn't I buy the tickets? So could you please tell me a couple of words, uh, how was it, what did you do there? Yeah, so it was it was amazing, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think, yeah, we, we all missed you, um, it was... Um, it was it, it was a little bit shorter because it was one day, so I kind of felt a little bit of pressure, you know, about meeting uh, a lot of people uh, and talking to a lot of people because the next day, who knows, they might not be there. They might they might just you know uh, go home. Um, so yeah, I met a lot of cool folks, a lot of Twitter Twitter um, um, famous people. Uh, but I also, you know, we put the gang together. So uh, the the guys from uh, Helvetic Ruby were there. Uh, Casper was there. Marco. So we, it was almost like kind of the same gang from uh, uh, from Athens, from uh, Railsas. Um, and we spent the day together. Like we spent the evening after the conference, and then the next day the same. We just wandered around the the, the city. Uh, we went to Jonathan's uh, SaaS founders. Um, a meetup, which we'll we'll talk a little bit in this episode, and we just enjoyed Brighton because it's such a beautiful place. Uh, I, I I quite liked it, and uh, I think I'm gonna uh, head back uh, at, at some point. So it was quite nice, um, and uh, yeah, we missed you. Yeah, the talks were amazing. I mean, the format was a little bit different. It was kind of like a show. Uh, we didn't have like a break between each talk. Um, we it was there were like you know bulks uh, bulk bulk talks of like three talks one after the other, uh, and it was quite nice. Like all the speakers are like good showmen showmen and show women. So it was uh, it was quite different from uh, Rail Sass. I, I think Andy is a, a, a very good you know showman, and he put on a show, and everybody that that was there did did the same. So um, it was quite nice. I did a little bit of uh, Twitter live live tweeting the event. Uh, so if anybody is curious, they can they can check it out on on my account. I try to post photos about the the like the more important uh things about uh, about the talk so yeah uh, i was quite there. Nice. i was uh, refreshing quite, your quite twitter nice. feed all the time <laughs> and uh so you are organizing <laughs> friendly rb yeah. in uh, romania in uh, september and did you get any inspiration from brighton uh things that you would like to reuse oh, uh... oh definitely definitely so yeah it was a little bit of a research trip as well so um, you know, when you're doing this thing, you haven't planned events before. There are a lot of, you know, unknowns and going to other events, you can kind of see some of the, some of those unknowns and, and try to plan for them. So, um, yeah, definitely it was a good, good inspiration and good, good research. Yeah. Okay. Um, fantastic. Cool. But let's, but let's jump into this, this, yeah, let's jump into this week's, uh, episode. So. Uh, our guest today is Jonathan Markwell. Um, so he's the developer of CoGrid, a B2B customer research and competitor analysis tool. He provides strategic and operational support to SaaS businesses through his consultancy, Plain Scaling. Uh, prior to his current ventures, Jonathan helped three B2B SaaS uh, businesses grow to over 1 million pounds annual recurring revenue. One sold for 8.6 million. One now employs 70 plus people in his uh 
favorite uh, return health uh, and his favorite return healthy dividends every year since 2007. Uh, non depend uh, on non dependent on venture capital. So this is uh, quite impressive. Uh, he's a co-founder uh, of the Skiff co-working space in Brighton, and he's been running meetups and conferences for software developers and businesses business owners since 2005. Uh, so, hey, John, uh, welcome to The Friendly Show. Um, how's it going? Good. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> Great to see you, Adrian and Yero. Yeah, definitely. So for people that have been, you know, following us uh, recently, they probably know that we uh, shared an apartment in, in Athens. Uh, me, Yaro and Dainius kind of knew each other from, from before and we got an apartment and we had one extra room and we posted a Twitter, uh, a tweet saying that we're looking for somebody else if anybody wants to join and uh, you got in touch with Yaro and the rest is history and I, I'm, I, I feel very, you know, uh, thankful that you did and um, we, we met that way. I love serendipitous uh, opportunities like that. Um, I've been following Yaro for a, for a while. I think I knew of you, Adrian. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it was it was great to be able to hang out for for, for five days and um, and get to know you more than than would be able to just in a conference. Definitely, yeah. It, it was a it, it was a nice time together. Um, Coolio, so tell us a little bit about about the the skiff. Um, Sussex founders and and other products and endeavors you are involved with, because um, I'd like to know more. When when was the skiff? Um, when did the skiff come to in, come into your life? Sure. So uh, I co-founded the the skiff uh, co working space in Brighton in um, two thousand eight, um, and uh, it was kind of uh, I say it's sort of an accidental co working space in that. Um, I'd started, uh, I'd gone independent and then I was running my own business. It was essentially a freelance business um, that had grown a little bit and into a, into a small agency. And for the first seven months of that, um, I was working from home. Uh, and, um, and you know what? It got me down quite a bit. I wasn't used to home working. This was 2006, 2007. Uh, I'd just been at university. Um, and I'd also had a, had a graduate job, uh, at American Express where we were in a cohort of graduates. And so I was used to sort of being around a team and, uh, and people around. And so, uh, the first thing I did, uh, to try and counter that and create some of the, uh, the, uh, the, the nicer things of, of an office environment was I got an office for the, for the agency in a, um, in the, in the university innovation center, which I'd had various jobs in, um, before. And so there were, I think five of us, um, eventually, uh, in that little office and, um, and, and it was nice. It was, it was much better than, than working from home, but, um, there were loads of things going on in central Brighton and we were out of town, uh, at the, on the university campus. Uh, and, um, uh, we felt kind of detached from all the great things that were going on in town. There are lots of meetups, programming meetups and other kinds of meetups that are going on, uh, that we wanted to be involved with. And so the first thing we did was we started a meetup, which, um, initially was called, um, open coffee Sussex. Uh, which was, uh, inspired by the open coffee movement, um, which had started recently as a, as a meetup to get founders and investors together. Uh, and so we started this at the cafe at the innovation center and, um, and hope that we could bring a meetup that brought some of those people we like, we like to hang out with out to us, um, at the university campus. And, um, and also that it would get some of the people out of all the offices in this building that were usually hidden behind closed doors. Um, yeah. It was successful in getting people, um, a few people from Brighton. Um, it didn't get many people out of the, of the offices in the, in the building. Um, but we started to build a bit more of a network. And ultimately we decided actually where we really wanted to be in, in town where everyone else was, was working. And so we teamed up with a few freelancers we'd got to know, took on a, uh, uh, 18 month lease. I think it was initially for a, for a small, um, uh, building. And, um, and we kind of had this open door policy where anyone, you know, we had spare desks. Um, so, uh, anyone could come along. Not long after that, I realized actually running an agency and being responsible for payroll wasn't something that, um, that made, that brought me joy. And, um, uh, and, uh, the guys that, um, the team, the team I'd 
hired. Uh, they wanted to, they saw the sort of bright lights of the city and and wanted to go to to much better paying jobs um, elsewhere. Uh, and so uh, so the agency sort of became just myself and, and my wife. And we needed to then make sure that we could pay the lease on this building. And so, yeah, and this all happened very quickly, really, over the course of a couple of months um, of taking on that lease. And so we said, well, we should probably have some sort of membership and uh, chatted to people in the community. And um, and then we, we, so we sort of stumbled into, into it being a full-blown co-working space. Nice, nice. And how did how did sussex founders uh that how does that fit into that was that something that uh came out of the skiff or like from from those meetups uh how, tell us a little bit uh, about that yeah so um so we'd started this meetup that was called open coffee um first uh and um we uh and so really we we built a bit of a community around ourselves or had an event that we were known for for organizing before we started a co-working space and we were going to lots of events. So we'd, we'd met lots of people. We didn't just declare to the world that we're opening a co-working space and have people turn up with, these are all people that we already knew and had got to know through, through different meetups. Um, and, um, and over the years we realized actually we were less interested in, um, I, I worked on that event with a few different people and each person that I worked with actually, none of us were actually really into raising investment and going down the, the VC track of, of startups um, and open coffee wasn't very descriptive unless you knew of the wider open coffee movement and so um, we decided to change the name to, to Sussex Founders that still was fairly non-specific but essentially it was software businesses that, that were mostly self-funded um, and um, and that had it had it's had various inclinations over the years it's actually been quite a while since we had a um, a, 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 a regular meetup, um, but the meetup you mentioned, um, we, it made sense to sort of fit under that brand um, when uh, when we had the the, the SAS Saturday uh, after Brighton Ruby. After Brighton, yeah, definitely, yeah. So this is this is so right now in in these times, like everybody's talking about SAS, about you know indie and bootstrapping and how like. I'm going to air quote this, like how easy it is to, you know, start at least try to have like a SaaS business within, you know, with a tech product. When, when did you think, when do you think this, um, so this is like in modern times, when do you think like you started noticing this trend, this, uh, you know, type of like SaaS business and entrepreneurial, you know, movement, uh, in, in, in Brighton and in the UK? Uh, I mean, I feel it's pretty early. I mean, around the same time I started my business, I mean, I, I was in, you know, part of the inspiration was actually discovering um, Rails and the things that I could do and then seeing what Basecamp was doing. And this was sort of back in um, early 2006, um, maybe even earlier. Um, that kind of business was one that I would like to make. Uh, but I realized, uh, then I, I still didn't feel like I had the resources to, to do it, to go all in. So I, I'd created a consulting business stroke agency. Um, and, um, and there were a few others that I would meet around this crowd of software developers that were taking different, um, different paths. Uh, and I guess, you know, it was more obvious that there was, uh, more people directly in that, you know, within uh, sort of having awareness of all, all this going on as I discovered other conferences that were being organized, like um, MicroConf, um, that were bringing people together that had similar kinds of value sets and wanted to create con similar kinds of um, businesses. Yeah. Cool, yeah, that that makes sense. Um Cool. Tell us a little bit about like CoGrid and and what you're what you're trying to build. Is th is that ready to to talk about, or do you want to still keep uh, it in the dark a little bit? Yeah, if you're not embarrassed by it when you launch, you've launched too early, right, or too too late. Definitely. <laughs> um, uh, so Definitely. Uh, Definitely. it's uh, it, it's it's really it's a it's a side project for me. Um, uh that you know i've been noodling on various different ideas um around it for for years um it has lots in parallel with other businesses that i've that i've worked on um the idea being that you can um 
get a, do a lot of re- find out a lot of things about companies just by having the starting point of their domain. And we all know this that we can go and just look at the website with a domain, and we can do various Google searches and find them elsewhere. Um, and so it's sort of building on that to see what you can do with a group of domains and what you can find out. So it might be a list of competitors or it might be a list of, uh, of customers. Um, and so the, uh, the version that is just about, uh, working, uh, which you can find at cogrid.com, you can throw in a bunch of, uh, domain names, um, of companies that you're interested in, and it will give you some things back, um, to sort of start, a uh, a, a journey of researching them. Um, and it starts off by sort of prioritizing them by what we think is uh, the more significant of those businesses that you've put into the into the box. Um, it actually has and, a similar... uh, I wonder. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering how does it uh, find the similarities? Do you use AI? <laughs> <laughs> the main question. <laughs> um, I've avoided using that that buzzword with this uh, recently, knowing how cynical people can be uh, around it. Although less so now than than they were, but yeah, it does have a few uh, some AI elements in the more advanced versions that I'm bringing into that that free version. Um, at the moment, it's working on uh, various different data sets that I've found that are freely um, and openly available. Um, uh, and focus purely on, um, on on information about the companies, um, and so it's it's finding categories that those um, those businesses maybe have self identified into on on LinkedIn, um, uh, but uh, there are yeah there's loads more that I've I've got under the hood that will be will be helped out by by some AI yeah mm, I like the way you said like the way businesses self identified <laughs> like. Yeah. Uh, I know you can uh, self-identify as if you are like I know doing something, but in real in, in real life you're I know building something quite different. Yeah, like, I, I mean, know, one some of the, kind of cigarettes. We, 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 cigarettes self-identify as we bring the stress relief, but uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, a, a frustration I've had with other tools that do this same kind of job that that CoGrid um, is is currently doing. Um, the the challenges that they use it you, you categorizing a business for example it's usually quite a small list of categories and so when you look at if you've got a lot of um, customers that are SaaS companies uh, all of them end up as software businesses and that's the only categorization you really get or internet business and then a few variations on that yeah. just depart- descending on whoever set the LinkedIn profile up which one of the two categories they felt they most uh, fit into <laughs> and so I, I, it's much more useful if you've uh, if you've maybe got, you can categorize a company into one of the categories that you've defined for your customers um, or, or or your competitors, and so it can get on a quite a granular level. And so, obviously, you know that's where some of the AI stuff comes in, looking at content on um, the websites of those companies to to uh, to figure out the right category based on the list of categories you want to use, for example. Mm-hmm. And uh, what is the value that uh, CoGrid is supposed to provide? Is like uh, find uh, similar alternative solutions uh, or uh, like find whether a company is legit? Um, ultimately, the, um, the, the, the free version um, is sort of satisfies some curiosity um, just to see who uh, is, if the... If, if what CoGrid thinks your customers are matches what, what you think your customers are. Obviously, there's lots of different ways you can do research and, um, that are like um, customer interviews, uh, finding people talking about their businesses on, on the internet um, uh, and, um, and doing surveys and getting information directly from them. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot that's missing if you don't know other places to look and find out things. Um, uh, uh, about about companies and so um, yeah. Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Your question there. Yes, yes. Well, okay, Jonathan. I, I I think I just understood. Basically, imagine yeah. I've got like uh, some kind of app, and I have uh, a list of uh, emails of my uh, uh, customers, and uh, I know most of them will be maybe not like at google.com but uh, at uh, their business domain.com, and basically I would just paste in. Uh, a list of uh, the emails and it would find uh, uh, information about the companies that uh, 
the emails yeah. belong to. So I get like in, some aggregate information about the companies that uh, I work with. Yeah, and so the and and so you get that curiosity curiosity satisfied as a value return from the from initial free use, but where it becomes I think more valuable is uh, we can then monitor those companies for you. So if you have um, uh, uh, the, that list of customers or that list of um, suppliers, you don't want to be googling them and, and doing research uh, manually every week to keep up with what they're up to. Uh, you want to go and find out. Um, uh, you want you want to be told when something happens. You want to be the first to know if something significant changes that might impact your your business. And so, some of the sorts of things that we might be able to detect that you might miss, and I've missed uh, with um, my clients in the past, have been uh, one of your uh, customers being acquired. And so suddenly, like I've had recently, one client that. Um, didn't realize they had Amazon and Canva as customers, um, but at, but it, that happened because two of the, their customers were acquired, one by Amazon, one by Canva, and we've seen others uh, as well. And so it's really interesting to sort of find that out early because then you know that someone from their security team is going to be maybe getting in touch to, to get you on board as a proper yeah. supplier, and you sort of can, can be prepared for that. Um, and, um, and, there, and there's various other... Uh, things that can that can happen so like we don't always know where our customers are finding out about it's very difficult to find out how how customers have um, found out about you especially if they don't answer to surveys um explaining and so one of the things that i can do with cogrid is i have um I, i'm sort of building a database of of companies that are members of different chambers of commerce and it could be other groups it could be sussex founders it could be participants in different conferences and so you then get to see um, where there have maybe been some crossover. And so you might see that there's a cluster of companies that are all members of Sussex Chamber of Commerce. Um, and it's like, oh, maybe they've been talking to each other and that's how they found out about the business. Yeah. And therefore, you know, maybe we can, we can help accelerate that either within that Chamber of Commerce or maybe there's an opportunity in other ones. And so over time, I want to build, mm-hmm. you know, more and more um, connections like that, which aren't immediately obvious about the companies that you're that you're working with, so you can find growth opportunities. I mean, I can imagine that, uh, for example, somebody owns a newsletter and uh, they want to like know their readers, and they just like up, um, I know uh, in the newsletter app they have uh, the CoGrid. Uh, uh, plugin and they kind of uh, link their customers and uh, Cogrid does the analysis of their like uh, emails and give some insight like uh, about your newsletter what companies uh, that use your that, that read your newsletter some kind of like aggregate some kind of yeah that's that's really cool absolutely it, it feels and- like this is the this is a tool where people are going to use it in so many different ways that you imagined it so uh, it's really cool maybe i mean that could be uh you know a, a, a challenge for me in uh, in in selling it like the the business i've worked in, in, with before uh, that have been most successful and easiest to grow have been in a very narrow niche solving a very specific problem for a very yeah. specific group of people and so i'm uh, acutely yeah. aware that um i haven't yet focused on a particular niche mm-hmm. with this and it's more of uh you know it's in danger of being a solution in search of a of a, of a problem um uh but right. you know it's, it's a tool that i've used um so i'm kind of scratching my own itch uh yeah. it's uh it's it's something i can i can have on the side of my of my consulting work for the moment and we'll see we'll see where it goes and see if i get pulled into one specific niche or or, or which way it goes yeah, definitely. So this is the cool thing that I would look at it at, as a, a, a blank canvas where you can try and validate multiple, you know, niches, right? Because you can use this tool in multiple ways. So you can, you know, try the first niche for, you know, a month, then try to market it for a different one and, and so on. So definitely, yeah, this this is the, but, you know, scratching your own itch, it's definitely the best the best way to go. I mean, I yeah. really like well, the idea done. of... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I like the idea of, uh, let's say, like having 10 different uh, landing pages uh, based on the different applications of the same solution. So, uh, I know, imagine you sell an app for, like, uh, making appointments. And, like, uh, uh, the dentists visit the landing page where, like, it's uh, the CRM for dentists. Uh, 
masseurs visit and see like see around for masseurs. <laughs> so uh, kind of personalized uh, messaging uh, to different niches, but same yeah. solution. <laughs> we, maybe. We Maybe you can do like, you know, every time the page reloads, you have a different web, page, a different homepage <laughs> to target that yeah. towards a different niche. I think I'm going to have to get decisive like at that. some point, but um, there's certainly some, <laughs> some things, some things around there that I, I think I can do. I've got a few, uh, you know, uh, I think useful um, pieces of information that I can put out there for different groups and see if any of those get, get traction building on the data that, that I have. Um, I'm trying, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing a particularly good job of it, but I'm applying a, uh, um, a few different processes that I've learned, um, o over the years to, uh, to, to, to sort of find where, who this might be most valuable with. And, um, and one person, uh, you know, two people I've followed for a long time, Amy Hoy and Alex Hillman, um, have a program, uh, called, uh, 30 by 500. Um, which teaches a lot of, you know, a particular approach to um, to researching products, um, and it's, it was super helpful for me in a lot of the other businesses that I've that I've worked on, um, and it was really helpful to help, you know, get, you know, be very clear that this is a problem that people are actually searching for and, and, are, and, are, and are trying to solve, and um, and so I'm uh, I'm currently uh, in the process of. Um, a uh, a free pro course that they have called launch dot uh, uh, ftw launch for the win um which encourages uh which ha takes you through the process of creating some very useful pieces of of content for a specific audience i'm trying to be as specific as possible with that but sort of using what i have um from from cogrid uh as um uh, as as part of the value that i'm able to provide doing that yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, that, that definitely resonates with you know what what happens in in like I see how people try to streamline you know and and find their niche with the current like SaaS indie bootstrap SaaS businesses. It's like that you know you have to take a laser pointer and trying to find your niche as um, as quickly as possible and you know the smallest niche as possible so you can service it very very well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, and I've got a few. I've got cool. a list of a few things that I'm gonna sort of just be able to email people and say, "Here's a cool tool that you might be able to use in the specific niche that you're in." Let, tell me how you get on, and, and we'll we'll go from there. But yeah, nice. it's very very early days. <laughs> yeah, of course. How how uh, is this a full time thing, part time thing? It's just just on a weekend part thing for you. How do you see it? Uh, how do you yeah. do it right now? Part time at the moment. I mean. Uh, SAS Saturday kind of fits quite nicely with it sort of being my uh, a Saturday project. I tend to take a day off during the week and and so uh, and and then isolate maybe okay. doing that on a Saturday because I I home educate my kids so it's not so disruptive for me to work at the weekend and I can spend a day with them uh, during the during the yeah. week. Nice, yeah, that's cool. Cool. Let's uh, tell us a little bit about how how do you know Andy? Uh, I I know uh, so I know behind the scenes that you told me that you two started a, a different conference back in the day. Uh, what's what's the deal there? How how did you get to meet Andy and you know become friends? So and Andy Kroll, um, uh, the uh, the showman yeah. of, uh, of of Brian Ruby. Um, so I was trying to work this out, uh, but I think. Um, I, the first time he really came onto my radar was in early 2014. Um, and he'd just moved to Brighton from Singapore. And I think he'd, he, so he'd run a, a Ruby conference in Singapore. And, um, I learned about him when he announced on the local email list in Brighton that he was going to run a, a Brighton Ruby conference. I thought, wow, that came out of nowhere. Brilliant. Got a new awesome person in the community <laughs> and straight away they're, they're running a conference. A lot of people build up. Uh, over, you know, a few years before, before creating a conference in, in, in Brighton. Um, and I was super excited as a, as a Ruby developer, um, that, 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 that was going to happen. Um, so I got a ticket, uh, straight away, started letting everyone know that, uh, I knew, uh, in and around Brighton that had, um, uh, that, yeah, that, that there were Ruby developers. And, um, uh, yeah, so that's how I first, first found, heard about Andy. Um, and um i guess from there okay. i went to the conference um and uh i think it was either after that conference or maybe the the the, the second year um 
we'd actually previously had a Brighton Ruby uh, in 2008, okay. which was a meetup, um, which was actually started by uh, my my old boss who who introduced me to to Ruby, and so we had a meetup and a little Google group. Um, but it had uh, uh, when when James McCarthy had started that had moved out of town. It was uh, I think a few people tried to start it again, but it never really got going. Um, and um, and so uh, I suggested to Andy he might want to restart that, and he was welcome to use the skiff uh, as a as a venue. And so he did that, and so right. he became a member of the skiff eventually as well for a, for a while, um, and ran his meetup quite regularly there in between Brighton Ruby conferences. Uh, and um, okay. I think over, you know, then getting to know him more through those, those meetups, I, um, you know, it's pretty clear he really knew what he was, he was doing um, with, with Ruby and was a far better Ruby developer than I. And so there were a few projects I was working on that I, that I'd started and I asked um, uh, Andy to, to come in and help with, with a couple of those, um, and, um, one of them that sort of, uh, was, was doing the best, um, was, was coverage book. And my time was increasing, um, in, with, with them. Uh, uh, and, um, to the point where, um, I was, uh, I was essentially the full time, um, CTO at coverage book. Um, and, okay. uh, had you know Andy had been working with us on a on a part time basis as a contractor, and it was like I would feel so much happier if we had Andy fully on board as another team member, and so he sort of took on a VP engineering um, role uh, because nice. like it's nice to have the redundancy. You know, I don't want to be um, dependent at you know at, at all levels. We had a very strong team of. Um, of, of 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 developers that you know meant like you know it was possible to go on holiday but um it was great to have someone that i considered um uh completely a peer but also you know a, a way ahead of me on on a lot of things especially on um uh, on on the tech side nice nice yeah that, that, and and how how was the the first Brighton Ruby? So I, I I I approached Andy this year and I said like this is amazing. I think this is how this really show like the the conference is amazing. This really shows that you've been running it for ten years and it takes ten years to get here. And he looked at me and smiled like it was always like this. <laughs> it was always this nice. So how, how was that that Brighton that first Brighton Ruby conference? Uh, how did yeah, you was, feel it? It was a long time ago. It was uh, uh, so it was 2014. Um, it was smaller, uh, so it was uh, 160 people rather than about 500, which I think it was this year, or maybe more, more, more than 500. Um, and uh, yeah, it felt it felt like a good Brighton conference. I mean, we're very spoiled in Brighton. We have a few really good software um, related conferences. But, you know, we'd had one created by. Um, Clear left called deconstruct that had been running for a few years um and um and it was in the same venue uh as um as brighton ruby and so we were sort of used to this annual gathering a lot of us that were in the ruby community in brighton uh of a broad okay. um uh section of the tech community around the uk and europe coming to brighton for that um and so this is really I mean, nice that it was very people, that's a lot yeah, and so you know it was very different. I didn't. I knew that there were a lot of people there that I didn't get to see. I didn't. I couldn't. I didn't. Even, you know, some people I saw across the room and then didn't manage to go and find and and and, and chat to later. And um, and other people I'm sure that were there because I saw they were mentioned they were going on on Twitter, but didn't manage to to find them at all. So you know that that was different. Um, whereas you know as we all met in uh, at, at Rails SAS, which is a nice small, I think around seventy person conference. Um, I'm much more comfortable there. I I had a I had quite a bit of anxiety about going to Brighton Ruby this year because, uh, you know, I like smaller conference, like smaller gatherings. And this was the biggest gathering that I'd been to of people since, since before, uh, the, 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 the pandemic. And I, and I thought there was a good chance that I was just going to, you know, shut down and, and not talk to anyone. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know the feeling. Yaro, you, you wanted to, to pitch in? Oh, yeah, uh, it's okay. And uh, I mean, it's uh, amazing that uh, you've been on the roots of uh, so many things. 
<laughs> yeah, and, definitely uh, exciting finding out mm-hmm. about you know the, how how it was back in the day. I mean, you don't look uh, so old, but uh, you can talk about <laughs> how it's been back in the day. I mean, you've started like uh, a co-working space around 2008. T- around 2008, mm-hmm. I had no idea of the concept of co-working space. I mean, uh, yeah, I, was there know, even I, uh, work? I, <laughs> Yeah, I was very early on on Twitter as well, and I'm uh, and, and as more of a lurker than a um, oh my. My youngest has invaded, so just bear with me a moment because he has a tendency no to worries, be a bit no noisy. Just a moment. Um, where were we? Uh, yeah, so being around early on, yeah, I, I, I've been sort of lurking on Twitter since since very early. I, I think I, uh, I I got my account pretty much the day that accounts were more openly available on, in 2007, and and that sort of plugged me into lots of people that were thinking about very progressive ideas. So hearing it, you know, being aware of the co-working movement and some of the things that were happening in, in the US and a lot of the startup movement um, following you know the early days of, of Y Combinator and and all sorts of things around that um, and uh, in a, and being in Brighton where there are lots of people that are interested in in similar things it sort of then amplified um, being in that in that whole uh, world um, and um, yeah, and you know there are lots of things that you know I've had false starts on as well. In that I did have a assassin that I started in two thousand and eight, and ended up selling for a uh, very small amount of money, really, in in, in twenty twelve when it uh, didn't didn't really work the way I thought it should be working. But in retrospect, it was probably in a fairly good place. Um, and um, yeah, guys, sorry, I'll have to be leaving now. But uh, I, I mean, everything's been recorded, so I will. Uh, uh, happily listen or watch uh, whatever you speak about uh, after they're done. So uh, it was great speaking to you and talk to you later. Definitely. No worries. Good to see you. Thank you. Cool. Uh, yeah. So one of my next questions were like, you know, what what do you how do you what do you think you know Brighton Ruby changed over time, but. You know, um, you told us, it, you said like, you know, more people, right? There are more yeah, people. Yeah, I mean, you know, Andy is very good at being um, consistent and um, and bringing great people together from all, from all around, around the world. I don't know how much, like I, I before Brighton Ruby, I never, uh, I'd only been to Ruby meetups in Brighton and London. Um, and I think there was like an overnight rails camp, uh, that I did, uh, in, in Margate in the UK, um, which was a lot of fun. And that, that brought some people in from, from, from around Europe. Uh, but I hadn't sort of gone to, to any of the main conferences that were, that were Ruby focused. And so it was really, you know, great to have someone that was plugged into that world, bringing, bringing people to, into Brighton that I'd seen. Um, you know, I'd known from Twitter and known from seeing their commits on, on rails and, uh, and, and things like that. And it, and I think, you know, and Andy's just kept that going, you know, he does the work to go and find and, and, and get to know people around the world that, uh, that make Ruby special, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and brings them to town. Um, and, uh, you know, and that, and I, I forgot to mention actually that we all, you mentioned it, that we, we organized a conference together and we, we sort of, uh, so Andy managed to, uh, I was talking to him, um, at one of the Ruby meetups, I think in Brighton. And he said, oh, I might have, um, Patrick McKenzie, who's Patio 11, uh, on, uh, on, on yep. Twitter and everywhere, yep. uh, yeah. booked to come to Brighton Ruby in, uh, in the summer in 2016. This was sort of February, March time, I think. And, um, I said, well, okay. Patrick's coming, like he really knows the bootstrap and, you know, the, the, the SAS world so well that, you know, we, we were both, yeah. both into. And so if he's coming all the way from Japan, um, and you're flying him in, well, you know, if we run another conference, we you can, we can share the cost of that plane ticket and, uh, and, and, and the accommodation and, and, and things. Okay. And, um, uh, and, and maybe we can, uh, round, round some other interesting speakers up. And so, uh, so when Patrick said yes, we thought, okay, let's do two, two conferences. And so we had Brighton Ruby. Uh, I think it was LTV Conf on the, on the Wednesday, maybe, and then Brighton Ruby on the, on the Friday. Uh, and so it was a heavy, busy week for, for Andy, um, doing, doing two conferences in, in one week. 
Um, and, um, and yeah, we just, uh, you know, we got loads of, loads of great people together for a, for a sort of more yeah. software internet product business conference alongside, um, Brighton Ruby. Yeah. Def- so running one conference is, is, uh, quite a chore running two in the same week. I, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Um, is, is that conference still going on? Uh, I bet, are you, are you, are, is Andy still organizing it? No, we, we, we ran it, um, for a, for a second year and, and we did decide that, okay. uh, for Andy, two conferences is in, in one year. And, um, for me running a co-working space and a conference when both of us had full-time jobs really as well was, yeah. uh, and two young children yeah. was, was too much. And so, yeah. um, we, we ended up actually, uh, selling the conference to FE International, um, who, uh, who had spoken at the second conference and had attended the first one. And it really was a good fit for them to, okay. to take it on. And they ran a, a few more until, um, until COVID and they, they, I think they had to cancel the last one that they had that was going to be in San Francisco in, uh, in 2020. And unfortunately it hasn't, hasn't restarted okay. again yet. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That, that's cool. So what, okay. Getting back to Brighton Ruby, what did you like? Did you, what did you enjoy the most this year? Uh, I just love, love being uh, informed and entertained at the same way. It just it was, it's just like, it's so fun. You know, like the whole experience uh, of learning new things. Yeah. Like every talk, I think I learned completely new, new things. Uh, I think with, with <laughs> Andy, like from Eileen's talk at the very beginning, um, it's a small takeaway, but uh, Andy mentioned it as well. I always thought that... Um, uh, that rail uh, rails tie rail ties were called rail tees uh, because when you just read this thing over and over again and then you find out oh no it's rail ties which makes so much more sense because it's tying these different parts of rails together uh, and it's like little things like that um, and there's you know loads of other things that either consciously or subconsciously are having a whole day of um of 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 hearing from the from from a, um, incredible people that are contributing to the community in lots of different ways um and um you know and have much deeper knowledge uh than i do on a whole, a whole range of topics i just you know feel yeah. you know enriched from it and and the fact that you know andy gets people together that can y- y- entertain you at the same time as telling you th- things that could otherwise be pretty dry is is just a wonderful yeah. wonderful thing no, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. Like all the talks were very not only like you know showmanship, but definitely learn new things. I, I think I enjoyed. I seen a, a cool thing like Tim Tim Riley uh, spoke about Hanami and you know how it's a good alternative. And you know I think it was a little bit of a theme this year. And all Gibbs spoke about this like you know maybe Rails is not the perfect project for for per, like the perfect framework or tool for any project you might have different projects that other tools might might go with them but after like tim riley's uh intro to hanami i've been speaking with people uh in in the lounge and everybody was like hey i just want to go back to my hotel room and do hanami for an hour or two like uh, it sparked my curiosity so i think people were very you know entertained and into all of, all of the all of the talks yeah so definitely yeah great. yeah it's my my first time hearing great about it an army um and um yeah i got too many two different things on i wasn't quite you know pulled into uh in into into going and trying it out but it's definitely on my radar now and you know there are other things around you know having fun and uh you know ma- having always making a bit of a game you know trying making something that's not for the purposes of making money was another uh takeaway yeah. i had and you know maybe you know there are things that i could just do for fun in co-grid that sort of get me you know allow me to just uh uh have some programming fun Unwind. and um and, yeah. and do, do some interesting stuff without a you know a, a, a financial goal in mind i i really like that um and noah's talk actually yeah. You know, that really resonated there with me is I, I, I work with teams that aren't just working with rails and, um, uh, you know, and it's so important to, you know, I think one of his first commandments was, you know, don't use rails. The team doesn't want to use rails. And, um, you know, and I see, you know, some teams being pulled in directions that, uh, uh that they just don't want to go in. And, you know, and that's got to be the first thing that you, uh, that, that helps you make any decision like that is what, what the team wants to do. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, just for the record, Noah Noah's talk. So it's Noah Gibbs. Uh, he, he his talk was titled "When Should You Not Use Rails?" and it was a very very good and informative talk. Like a lot of good points there. Um, 
So, Jonathan, I have this question, like I, I've been asking people at the conference as well, like, what do you think people gain? What do you gain by going to conferences? Uh, it's a little bit of a question of a research question for myself, like people have, met, have been asking me about Friendly Ruby, what is that about? But I'm curious, what do you think you gain by going going to conferences or other people? Yeah, I mean, it's something... It, it's it's a feeling that it's very difficult to put into into words and because i've you know been around you know in the business of creating communities and of different kinds be they meetups or co-working spaces you know I, I feel like i maybe have more of the vocabulary than, than other people would immediately jump to for this but for me you know a, a good conference i feel a sense of belonging like i'm not alone I'm, you know, there are lots of people that have very similar ways of, of, uh, of thinking about the world. And, um, and I find it, you know, great learning from people that have, you know, some parallels to my own, uh, but where they've gone deeper into that to topic in some other way. And so just, you know, getting this feel, the feeling that I'm in a crowd of very smart people where we've got a few things in common and then loads more that we can learn from each other from that starting point of what we, what we have in common. Um, yeah. And we, you know, I felt this from uh, you know, rail SAS was interesting because it was, you know, such a super niche, you know, some, you know, I, I think when actually Andy and I started rails uh, started LTV conf, we, we thought about whether or not it should be a rail SAS conf, you know, but it, we just felt that would be too niche, even though we were bringing loads of people to the city for a Ruby conference, we wouldn't get enough people to, to, to turn up to be able to cover the tickets for the, you know, and the, and the, and the amount that we were paying the speakers, um, for, for something so small. And so, um, yeah. uh, you know, we had to go, we had to go broader and maybe we went too broad. I'm not sure, but, um, uh, you know, having that base, you know, having that one interesting thing that brings a whole bunch of people together from all over the country, all over the Europe, all over Europe and maybe all over the world. Um, I think it just creates this yeah. very special, um, environment uh yeah. where yeah you learn you learn lots and meet people and make good friends um yeah yeah and and you 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 find out that you're not alone because you know building SaaS and indie like this uh as a developer it can be a little bit lonely right? yeah and you know i use uh i've used twitter a lot over the years and you know some years less than others but um and and hung out in other places on on the internet and for me, I really struggle, and I know some people are, you know, completely fine with this. I really struggle to make conversation or, um, with, with complete, with people I've never met in person. And so once, um, you know, I've, I've met people, I have this common experience with, with someone. It's so much easier to, um, to sort of maintain that relationship and get to know them better, maybe do some work together. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, ha and have, uh, other people that you, you know, when you, if you do go to a few conferences that you can look forward to seeing in different places, um, around the world. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds, that sounds amazing, man. Um, okay. So trying to wrap this up, like, what are you looking forward to next year? Like an event, a piece of technology, a personal endeavor. What, what are you looking up, uh, looking forward to like this, this year, this next year? Um, I think, uh, I'd really like to go back to Rails SaaS in Athens and have a SaaS that has some customers. Um, would be would be great. I'd okay. also like to uh, to to do more of the fun stuff in Athens. I was a bit boring and did some work on the day when you had a really fun fun time uh, uh, in Athens, and uh, and I'd love to uh, to see if we can get a get a sailing boat for a few days and have a, a bunch of SaaS Rubyists sailing around the Mediterranean a little bit before or after after the conference so that that would be um that'd be pretty cool yeah definitely that would be just fantastic definitely yeah that's so now this is something that i look forward next year as well like you know going to athens and, and getting a sailing boat and, and doing this together sounds amazing yeah um okay so we have just one more question uh this is something we ask every like ruby rails developer what's like your favorite gem to that you always um reach out too. or not always but you really you really enjoy hmm. so um uh i immediately want to say you know one one tool i've used in uh in so many of the projects i've used including co-grading and, and and coverage book 
is uh, is actually a company I'm working with at the moment um, uh, called URL Box. They do have a gem, and what URL Box does is it's a screenshot as a service uh, tool, and um, and it was great to be able to you know end up working with them because I've been a customer for for years and love it, and it just makes the the process of um, of getting a good high quality screenshot um, from a uh, a website so much easier and a whole load of other um, useful features um, as well for for getting data from from websites. So that one's it's kind of a cheat because your box is so simple that you don't need to use a gem for it, but there is a gem. And so I, I kind of have another gem that I would also mention, which uh, which I really like, which is related, uh, the PostRank uh, URI gem, um, which uh, I find myself using a lot, and it's super useful for extracting domain names, um, valid domain names from any block of, of text. So I find myself uh, adding that um, all the time. And I thought you know, they'd be a little bit different from... Uh, Mentioning device or uh, you know some device, other common yeah. gem. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Cool. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Where can people find you online? Uh, so I am uh, probably still on Twitter, uh, J O T, and I'm also on uh, Mastodon uh, dot social, also J O T on there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Sounds amazing. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan, for being with us today. You know, telling us about how you know Bright and Ruby started, and um, and uh, every like you know all all of those insights from back in the day. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see you again in on the next conference or uh, another event uh, and uh, hang out. I'm I'm looking forward to it. My my mind often wonders to how I'm going to try and make it to Bucharest for for friendly um, that I be. That is the next conference I really want to go to, uh, um, but we'll we'll have to see because uh, it's difficult traveling uh, with, yeah. with, with 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 kids and, and things. So um, yeah, looking. Thank you so much for 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 having me on. It's been great. Definitely. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, have a nice week ahead of you. See ya. You too. See you then.